appropriate. Uh, as we do that, uh, George, introduce yourself. Jordan, introduce yourself. And then, George, you take it over. All right, thanks, Dan. And, and for those of you that had uh, issues hearing Stan's audio, uh, long story short is he said, welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, he sounded a little bit like Max Headroom there, for any of those that are old enough to know who that is. Um, but uh, thanks, Stan. Uh, my name is George UC. Uh, I am uh, uh, on the Leadership Council for Secure the Village, uh, as well as a, um, a longtime network and security engineer, um, uh, primarily uh, uh, focused in uh, internet governance, as well as cybersecurity governance. And uh, uh, I'll give Jordan an opportunity to introduce herself here because we have a, a two-threaded um, set of presentations here. One that is really targeted towards everyone can be valuable to the CEO and is mainly targeted towards that conversation you'll have with the owner, or the CEO of a business to help them adapt a cybersecurity mindset. Uh, go ahead, and Jordan, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Thanks, George. Um, I'm Jordan Fisher. I am co-founder and managing partner of XKM Law Group. We're a boutique international and domestic cybersecurity and data privacy law firm. In addition to that, I'm a cybersecurity and data privacy lecturer at UC Berkeley in the School of Information. I'm also a professor of law at the Thomas R. Klein School of Law at Drexel University. And in both those capacities, I do a lot of academic research around cybersecurity, digital economies, et cetera, sort of the evolution of this space. So I'm really excited to be here to sort of be, I guess, the lawyer in the room to provide that perspective, which sometimes can, yeah. that word liability and risk can wake people up to, to different cyber and privacy concerns. So thanks, George. I'm excited to be here. Great. So the first part of our webinar is going to focus on uh, what essentially is the cybersecurity, privacy, and governance mindset. So for those of you that are technical, a lot of this should resonate with you. Um, there might be a lot of kind of face palm to the head things going on because you can relate to, to some of the things that you've experienced, trying to get the message to other department leaders, um, to executives, uh, and even the CEO in the boardroom in terms of cyber risk. and, and uh, and so we're going to uh, talk uh, about that first, and then we're going to segue into some of the deep dive components of what essentially are some of the regulatory issues, as well as the NIST framework and cybersecurity governance, but focus mainly on privacy, which is what Jordan is going to be covering. So we appreciate your time today, and um, I'm going to get started here. And I, I do have to apologize. Uh, I do not uh, have a ton of experience with GoToWebinar, so um, if I make a mistake, um, my apologies in advance. I figure that uh, all of you here are uh, uh, at home, so um, if we will definitely uh, be having some resources here that you can link to and a survey as well if you're interested um, towards the end that will communicate through chat. So. Let's start first with uh, uh, a quote that we um, we just uh, 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 that we just heard from Vint Cerf. Uh, if you don't know, know who Vint is, he is uh, one of the original scientists who worked on the ARPANET and designed the internet. Um, I worked with uh, a lot of scientists like Vint in the 90s when I worked for uh, a, a service provider and, and backbone builds, and we were talking about things like IPv6 and next generation internet. And he basically said, hey, security is a problem here. Um, and in terms of safety and security of the internet, we, he would have to argue that we're not in a good place right now. So we're gonna talk about that issue because it really is a global issue. Um, uh, but the focus will be these five items is what are the driving forces of cyber risk, uh, a, a new cybersecurity air war, um, uh, with, we've, we've been kind of been fighting the ground war for a while. Now, those of you that uh, understand some of those analogies and scaling and uh, some of the uh, educational uh, and reading uh, opportunities that are out there for you may relate to that. Um, why mindset matters in cybersecurity and, and then kind of the how to lead this problem 
from an executive perspective. Um, and if you want to get into the head of an executive or the heads of executives, um, this webinar will benefit you because there'll be some tools that you can use to start those conversations. And then what you do now, right? So what do you, how do you approach the CEO or how do you as a CEO deal with it? So, uh, sorry, driving forces. So here are the whys. So why now? First, breach laws have been passed in all 50 states. We already are aware of the fact that there's a shortage of cybersecurity professionals. And um, more importantly, we, uh, I think it goes without saying that these breaches can get very expensive. So these are all things that are absolutely raising ears and the hackles on the backs of executives when they understand that the risk is greater than it used to be. Uh, and mainly that's through regulatory matters that, uh, that that risk becomes real, um, as well as, of course, public relations. Um, and most privacy, the other, the other issue is most privacy data, I think, is likely exposed to some degree already. And so that's another situation of, well, wait a second, well, who did it, right? It's kind of the finger pointing issue. And then data compromise does happen daily, and there are financial sanction, sanctions that follow them. It's also a function of the fact that breaches are expensive. And finally, executives are listening because of all these things. And so they wanna hear about this. And if they aren't aware of it and they're discarding it, then it's, uh, it's essentially all of our, uh, it's a responsibility for all of us to help educate them uh, so they can understand how they can uh, lead with a cybersecurity mindset. And that's because executives are accountable. That's what's happening in reality today. Um, and we're not just talking about CEOs, we're talking about all the C-suites, so the CFO, the COO, if a, if a cybersecurity breach is uh, originates because of negligence from one of those executives, there are accountability issues in some of these laws, uh, as well as into the boardroom. But yet digital deviants are still finding a way in. So how do we address this? Right. And this is what we call the new cybersecurity air war. Um, to some of you, it's not new, especially those that are risk managers, uh, 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 some of uh, Jordan's colleagues, as well as other privacy attorneys are already aware of this. Um, and this has a lot to do with some of the comprehensive privacy laws that are kind of cascading down through states. This comes directly off of a site um, uh, uh, for or the International Association of Privacy Professionals. You can go to IAPP and see some of the articles they have there. Um, and as you can see that uh, things are pretty active in state privacy laws. There's also, of course, likely federal coming and Jordan will talk to that. So I don't wanna take her thunder. But uh, notably, there's also been jail time uh, uh, legislation introduced for a fibbing executive. And I think this was, what, you know, whether or not that actually passes is another story, but this is what lawmakers are doing to wake people up in this. And just to add to that, George, real quickly on the jail time, in China, they can jail you already for any violations of their cybersecurity law. So that's not, a, that jail time thing is already in existence. We're just starting to see it come to the United States, so. Right. Yeah, good, good point. Um, and, and contextually, I think that uh, we're all we're living in an internet delivered world, which means you're doing business everywhere to some degree. So now let's talk about our geography, which we're in California. So for those of you that are in California and even in other states, there are what we call breach sin bins. It tends to be the attorney general. Um, I scraped off a, a screenshot of this from over a year ago. Um, uh, and uh, I do apologize to any of the businesses that were on this list as the example, but this is public data, right? So anybody can go and even a buyer could go and look to see if your company had been compromised. Um, so that's an issue as well. And the accountability is with the leader of that business. So in the conclusion is everyone must prepare for when. And, and, and that is essentially what I think Vint, the essence of what Vint was saying is that they said there needs to be some kind of a plan. There needs to be you know, some norms and, and even more is around what's happening in cybersecurity. And that can't come just from security leaders and IT leaders. The whole business and all of the people that work for that business need to be cyber guardians. And so, and, and, and generally part of that compass is that issue of 
having policy procedure or not having a policy or procedure that people can follow uh, along with that mindset because that's where a lot of these breaches come to or uh, come from originate from so so why does sorry why does mindset matter so mindset is uh, uh, is an interesting idea uh, a lot a lot of people might argue that it's pie in the sky um, but ultimately companies move forward with great vision and mindset we say mindset not footprint when we talk about leading a business and what's interesting is in the c-suite generally mindset is what's driven all the other departments yet all of a sudden we're in the situation where users and consumers don't trust businesses and the belief is that for the most part the leadership teams would take the, the security problem and kind of toss it over the fence to the techs and to the security folks and go okay delegate and lawmakers are saying well that's clearly not working so when we talk about mindset we're talking about how does the whole business lead cybersecurity? how does a ceo um uh, and even if there's sensitive data and operations how does the coo you know make sure that everyone understands that they're that it's important for everyone to be involved in, in the cybersecurity problem even if you aren't a techie so and this is what we believe can address user issues. And the origin of that is essentially what, what we feel is an issue of cyber airbags are lacking. So you, the, the equivalent of a crash of a, in a vehicle, right? So for years we had seatbelts and no one would put them on, right? And then over time it became a law and then all of a sudden airbag laws came into place, right? Cybersecurity is going through a similar issue and it's kind of interesting because comp compliance is like a seatbelt, right? People will be compliant, you hope, but they get to choose whether they snap on that seatbelt. So by having an airbag in your digital world that can make sure that it can receive the impact of a hack, so to speak, makes a lot of sense. And so I think this is where a lot of these, um, a lot of these cyber laws are going to start filling up that airbag and you are gonna to have to build your build your airbag around those things. Um, you have to be able to lead, illustrate, and declare your position in cybersecurity. In a lot of cases, you're gonna be working with an attorney like uh, Jordan to make sure that you're declaring the right things according to your regulatory exposures. So put in your safety system. Yeah. So also, here's another one. So of the top 10 quotes we tend to hear from the CEOs or business owners before hack, well, we don't have any data anyone would want to steal. Well, that's a common misconception. So you'd be surprised how much data you may be pulling in through either social networks, websites, um, uh, uh, and, and the disclaimers that you might be missing to make sure that you're not in a situation where you are not in compliance with some of these privacy laws. And ultimately, the data you have, um, you know, if you have employees, you've got personal data. So, uh, and there um, are hooks there. Too. And George, one point that I often find to be a misconception, especially to a more US-based audience, is that often people think, if I have a social security number, I have to protect it, but anything else is fair game. Or if I, if I got it from social media or online. And the problem with that is that the, the data that requires protection is much broader than that, uh, uh, the way that the laws are being framed, especially under the European Union laws, it's personal data as broadly defined, the personal information definition under the California Consumer Privacy Act is very broad. And it's because we're recognizing that it's not just your social security number that has value and potential damage or risk to the individual. It could be my, my search history. It could be a wide variety of pieces of data. So I think a lot of people think, well, I'm not collecting my client's social security number, so I have nothing that would be worth stealing. Well, that's not the correct way to be thinking about it. It's more that you have these pockets of data that when combined with other pockets of data could have value. And so we need to be mindful of all of that information. So I just wanna point that out because especially we tend to focus on personally identifiable information, which in the US often was social security number, healthcare information, or financial data. And we need to like get out of that mindset. Yeah, no, absolutely. So for the rest of these items, like security is an overhead, sure. Yeah, it's expensive. If you plan wisely, though, you're going to save at least 50%. At least studies have shown that. Um, also, what I hear a lot is, hey, my IT and security teams are solid, right? So I don't have anything to worry about. I leave it up to them and, and, and they just take care of it. That's what legislators don't want you doing because it's, it's, 
and this is the issue that you, we have great IT and security people as well, right? But the problem is, it's kind of like playing a board game or playing a sports game, like a team sports, right? You'll have one person who's really excited about that board game or one person who's really excited, maybe the pitcher in a baseball game is excited about winning the game. But if the rest of the team isn't on board, you're going to lose, right? So, or it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a lot of fun either. So, so getting people on the same page, that's why mindset becomes important. And when you start conceding that, hey, I've got it taken care of because I've delegated it, you know, this is a, a problematic posture for uh, uh, lawmakers. So, then we also have uh, cloud service providers doing security. Absolutely, uh, but they're kind of like a furnished apartment. So who you bring in and out of the apartment, like these cloud providers, right, they'll provide the infrastructure, you know, the couches and the furniture, right? But if you catch something on fire in the oven because you let the wrong person into your apartment, you're accountable. So, so you gotta watch out for that one too, because what you move in and out of your apartment or is, is an issue. Uh, we're too small to get a regulatory fine and penalty. That is definitely changing. Changing our passwords, I think anyone that's still saying this has a bigger problem if they're not using things like multi <laughs> Um, That's so very true, George. Yeah. A a absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. we're secure, so why do we need to worry about privacy? Okay. Well, uh, you'll learn more when Jordan does her presentation as to why. <laughs> um, I bought cybersecurity insurance, and I've seen this as a, like, I've seen people paying quarter million dollars in premiums businesses pay um, to cover absolutely everything. But the, the real issue is, can you illustrate that you were doing the right thing when the claim gets filed? So there's a lot of claims being denied. Um, another one is, hey, we follow the best practices in cybersecurity. Okay, which one? Right? There's all kinds of frameworks. So where's your blueprint? What are you doing and why? And what's it for? Right? This is the essence of a cybersecurity program and a cybersecurity framework. And it doesn't have to be one. It may map to others. So also, hey, we've never been hacked before. Now, that we know of is something that I didn't used to have in this slide. So. Now, I think we're starting to see people come around and go, well, as far as I know, right? Um, and so uh, those are kind of the things that we, these are our warning signs that we see um, that maybe that a little bit more needs to be done, especially from the leadership outside of technologists and security professionals. So basic steps on how to lead. So this gets into the C-suite. So, um, uh, so I want to make sure that this is more of the executive process. I think a lot of you that are already technically competent, um, that have your certifications, um, whether it is a CISSP, right? I think you're gonna be nodding your head and go, yeah, this is probably makes sense uh, as an education for leadership that where I'm trying to articulate what needs to be done and how they need to get involved. So first, you've got to adopt the cyber mindset, right? You have to, uh, CEOs have to be involved with this issue. Yeah. Um, requiring a framework and, and then you essentially what framework are you going to be using and what cybersecurity program is going to wrap around that framework discover an audit so basically understand what you have on your hands right Where, what are the risks and at that point you can announce the program with the stream of frameworks or the framework that you've chosen uh, in this country generally NIST CSF is pretty common I think that has a lot to do with the fact that since NIST was built by our government, perhaps it's a lot easier, and I'll kind of yield to Jordan on this one, perhaps it's a lot easier to go into litigation and say, well, hey, judge, I followed your framework. So um, That's assuming we get to that point in the litigation, which I think is a broad assumption in the current uh, judicial environment in the U.S. So. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. And, um, and as well to earlier points you made, George, how deep into the framework must you follow in order to be able to say we're following the framework? Right. And that's the challenge of why um, it has to be addressed at the executive level, because you, you yeah. have to make that declaration as the leader and work with your attorney on how you make that declaration as well. So um, funding critical gaps is a, 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 so now you've got your program announced. How are you going to take care of those critical gaps? A lot of times in the past, security audits have been done and given uh, to the uh, IT teams or the IT teams that perform them or security professionals perform them. And they've come back to leadership and say, listen, we have these 30 things that we have to do. And either the CEO or the CFO says, I only have money for two. And then, you know, OK, well, what compensating controls might we put in place? And you try to sort out the best way to get there without breaking the bank. 
So, um, so have metrics and measures if you're doing that. And that's the great thing about being able to track and govern cybersecurity frameworks and progress in your uh, correction plans, as we call them, when you are funding critical, gap, critical gaps. And then make sure that the executive team is participating in the illustrate and, and illustrating with you. You want to make sure that 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 the executive suite is involved in at least at least minimum an annual meeting on the state of cybersecurity. We highly recommend quarterly. Uh, there are some uh, uh, there are some supply chain uh, constraints where you'll see that quarterly requirements and we have these things that perhaps you've seen them as a, as a as an IT leader or maybe a business leader where you're getting these looming checklists coming in from customers, vendors, suppliers. That's what they're looking, but they tend to say, hey, are you meeting quarterly at the executive level to talk about your problems in cybersecurity and to address them? So ask for accountability and then of course metrics and measures as I mentioned before. So how do you do it, right? Generally speaking, we love the crawl, walk, run model. And so the concept here is that you're, you're, so you're trying to figure out how to get this going. You know, I, yes, I'm interested in a cybersecurity framework. I, I know I need to get a cybersecurity program going. A lot of folks toss it over to the IT department and say, here you go. And then they can't land any meetings because it hasn't been made a priority. Now, if you've done all the other things correctly and it came from the top, then you'll be much more successful, but they're going to need help. And so the first thing you do is you discover your gaps, then you build the plan and make sure all leaders are buying off on that plan because their departments will be impacted too. And then announce that mindset to the common users, the producers in your organization in that first half of a year. And it's a kind of a two year journey to crawl, walk and run. And that's a pretty aggressive journey. Some companies take three years. So second half of year one, you're funding your critical gaps. Then you're establishing your metrics and you're illust you start illustrating right away what you're doing. So that becomes artifacts that could become very useful, but also becomes a marketing advantage for a lot of companies to show, hey, this is what we're doing with our cybersecurity posture and the program that we have and um, having that available for anyone that requires that you fill out a looming checklist uh, of compliance. And by year two, you're probably conducting some kind of a deep dive regulatory assessment. Now, some of you may already have gone through portions of year one. So you may find yourself doing a regulatory assessment like within six months to a year after starting your program. Um, and in some cases, depending upon your situation and in industry, you might start with a regulatory assessment to understand your privacy exposures uh, and any kind of other regulations that may impact you. So don't discount that as something you can't start early on. It's definitely something you could. Uh, and then you'll have to have that discussion of whether or not that requires attorney-client privilege, which I know Jordan uh, can talk to. Uh, then we have supply chain posture. Make sure you understand what your vendors are doing and how you're confirming that they're as compliant as you are and that they're following what essentially are some minimum checklist items themselves. So you'll be producing your own living checklist. And then of course, do that metric track, track it every quarter. Yeah. And the interesting thing about cyber posture, there's all these frameworks and Everybody loves an A grade, right? Are we 100% secure? That's probably not the right way to approach it. You know, if there's a metric system and, and what we suggest is you look at it kind of like a sleep number bed, right? You look at your industry and say, where should my industry be sleeping? What's the risk, right? Because you're probably not gonna wanna do what essentially is uh, hardcore high-end nuclear power plant level cybersecurity controls, right? It's gonna break the bank and it's probably gonna be untenable for you to manage. So if you go through what essentially is a simpler concept of saying, how hard should my mattress be, my cybersecurity mattress? And, it, and in my industry, maybe everyone else is about a 40 or a 50. Yeah? They're sleeping around there about 40 or 50 level. And then you do an assessment and you find out you're at a 20 or 30. Right? Okay, I need to get to 40 or 50. I don't think I need to be at 100 though. So maybe some of you do, but look at it that way, not as a grade. Okay. One of the things too I want to emphasize on the crawl um, walk around, which I love that sort of description, is you are never going to be upset with the amount of time you spend in that discovery phase. And the reason I say that is because no matter what law you are trying to comply with, no matter what client contract you're trying to comply with, or any security or privacy framework, standard, et cetera, the key things are going to be what data do I have? Where do I get them from? 
and what am I doing with it? And that discovery phase of sort of understanding your systems, understanding your data is going to be so key because if you come, for example, if you come to me pre-breach, I'm going to need to know that to identify the regulations, the standards, the contracts you have to comply with. If you come with me po to me post-breach, I'm going to need to know that to understand where you have to notify, what your obligations are. And that discovery phase is going to be, the, from my opinion, the most critical phase that's going to lead you quicker and faster to that run success and then keep you go running for a longer period of time. So I think a lot of people want to, oh, we have to really sit down and identify all the data, et cetera, but it really is so valuable and it's so informative. The first question I ask every client is, what is your data and where is it stored? And the little magical black box that most people will answer, the computer, is not a sufficient answer. So yeah. I think it's really a key component of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree to that, Jordan, and, and tell a, a quick story. We have a client that uh, we just put them through that exercise. They asked us to do some work for them, and we took it as an opportunity to ask them, uh, let's develop an information inventory. And the head of IT, as he's doing this, uh, has come back to us and said, wow, this is really valuable. I never knew, blah, 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 blah. And so what, what you're saying is just you know, get your head around what you've got, where it is, who's has access to it, and, and those things is so instructive from understanding it, now you can begin to secure it and keep it private. I think the most common response I get from IT is, before we start this assessment, I go, do you have any pay payment credit card information in your system? No, we of course don't do that. And then <laughs> I'm gonna say day two, day three of a data inventory, we find out that finance is scanning every credit card they've ever seen before and storing it in their Microsoft 365 account. And it's really informative. It's informative to everybody. And I think mm -hmm. everyone sits back and sort of goes, oh, wow okay, well, we can make actionable decisions because we can tie this to risk and liability and obligations mm -hmm. that we might have. And it's gonna make everything streamlined. I mean, that's the, it's, it's a, it can be an uphill battle because nobody likes to sit down and feel that you're asking them invasive questions, like where do you store your data? Because now all of a sudden they're wondering if they're doing it right, they're getting questioned. And especially when either the lawyers or IT walks in, everyone's a little worried something went wrong. Um, but I think it's so informative. So I really just want to put that emphasis on what George was saying, because it's the hardest buy-in from everybody, because everybody's got to get involved, but it's the best output that you can get. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, it, there's no question that, you know, there, that you're, there's a lot of people nodding their heads to everything that you've said. I think the issue, the biggest issue is, okay, how the heck do I do this? Right, so mm -hmm. I've got a process, but you know, what 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 am I supposed to be doing? Okay. So this next section um, on what to do now covers some of those higher level items. Um, first, your CEO, business owner, business owners. And I know in healthcare, for example, you might have 23 different doctors that own a business. They all have to understand and be able to illustrate action and investment into this problem. Okay, so. That's important. It, it, it won't go. That's first, right? That they have to be on board because if they're not, then the authority level of people that are in IT is limited to controlling and stopping, but you can't get people to move in the right direction. And that's the human element is a common thread this year, even at RSA 2020. That was the big one of the big themes was the human element. How do we deal with the people? And really, what they're talking about is organizational behavior. So, how is organizational behavior impacted? And so, what you'll find is that as a CEO, you may go, be going back to some of your business books and looking at examples and tips and tricks. Um, one of my favorites is, um, is "Scaling Up Excellence" by Huggy Rao. There's some great tips on how to motivate and move people using different tactics. Pick up that book and read it and reapply those, some of those lessons learned um, to the cybersecurity problem. Figure out how to scale that and cascade down throughout your business. So now- And George, I would add, oh, sorry. I just would add to that ownership. Oftentimes I think IT is viewed as the only owner of cybersecurity and privacy, but it's really owned by each department in unique ways that impact their operations. Oh, and absolutely. I often find like, I'll ask them a question and say, okay, 
how does marketing do X? I don't know, ask IT. Well, guess what? You own that process. IT might support it, but you own it. You're responsible for it, and you're responsible for reporting to whomever and how you do the metrics and everything. And so I think that ownership component is so key because so many times they want to they want to pass the buck, and you just can't do that with us. Yeah, and I'm, I'm holding it up purposefully so people can see it. Uh, something from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, cybersecurity is everyone's job. And you can mm -hmm. get this from either the NIST site or you can go to Secure the Village and, and get this. This is really done because they take each role in a business and they write a couple of pages about how cybersecurity touches that role, whether it's marketing or sales or HR or the C-suite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really nicely done. It's not long. Uh, easy to read and get your head around the, the this ownership question. Uh, one of the challenges I see regularly when we talk to uh, particularly the HR department, who's oftentimes responsible for training in an organization who has this myth that, oh, security is an IT responsibility. And until we can help the HR folks understand that they have a big role to play, uh, we're, we're missing an opportunity to uh, connect some dots here that are really vital. And the I next thing great talk. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to mention real quickly. I saw a great talk. Um, so I can't take credit for this at B side San Francisco this year. And the other key part of ownership is ownership comes with action items and tasks. So instead of going to IT to say, I want to use this system or this system, tell me which one is better. IT's response should be you do the analysis, you do the assessment, you conduct the risk assessment, or you look at the data uh, privacy impact assessment and provide me with that information. I can help weigh in, but you have to own that entire process. But to do that, you have to create a process that everyone can understand and is actually pushed out to all these different departments. So they should be conducting the risk assessment and then using IT to support that risk assessment to make the business sort of you know, pitch to, to go with a certain process. Yeah, and I think that's the part of the what we call the written security program as well, and um, uh, which is our third item on the list. I'll jump to that one because really that's where the discovery happens. All right? So, and you're almost always looking for outside help, um, so you have a fresh pair of eyes, and so that is a big piece of the puzzle, and where uh, uh, where folks like Jordan can help as well as our organization OmniStruck, but. You know, that's that's the critical piece is get, get that blueprint together. That's what we're talking mm -hmm. about is your blueprint, right? And then ongoing training is the other thing. I think there's a, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back up to that. Um, I think this is where a lot miss the mark. A lot of people miss the mark. They, they think that investing in a security training tool, hitting go and walking away is all you need to do. That's a tool, right? Tooling isn't the answer. A awareness program is the answer. Um, a great person that I, 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 I've seen speak and I think is really understands this well is uh, Dr. Izzo uh, um, she is uh, She would handle the security awareness program for United Airlines. Okay? So how do you train pilots while they're flying around in the air? How do, you, how do you conquer that? I mean, it's not like your passengers are gonna be really cool you know, knowing that the pilot is on the iPad watching security training while they're trying to fly the plane, right? It's probably not gonna work so well, right? Um, so how do you do that as somebody who's responsible for training everybody in the use of computers, even these s stewards, stewardesses, pilots, you know, that interact with these compute systems? Because everybody's te touching technology, even the baggage folks. Right. So and so hearing what she has done and how to launch those programs, that's a great she's a great resource for that. And those understanding how to build the program. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there are obviously a lot, a lot of other toolings that are out there that support that. But just remember, a tool doesn't solve the problem anymore. We're having the same problem. That's the ground war of cybersecurity, throwing a tool at something and hoping that it solves the problem is not enough. So, right. 
Yeah, one of the things on the ongoing training, and this is a pitch for Secure the Village, we have our weekly cyber news, cybersecurity news of the week and patch report, and that's available for free. Uh, you can sign up for it on the Secure the Village website, and it comes out every Sunday afternoon. It's about uh, 25 to 30 stories we aggregate uh, from the cyber news in a whole host of different categories, uh, yeah. stuff affecting the individual on privacy and identity theft, things for businesses to know about. And then the broader subject is just citizens in a democracy, uh, all the issues that happen there. And that's free. And it's a way to keep uh, cybersecurity top of mind so that it's there. It's now gives people something to talk about, part of the conversation of mm -hmm. cybersecurity, which is, is, is so much important to what all the, you know, how do we get this stuff actually embedded inside the culture okay and so and so um i apologize jordan we're not leaving you a lot of time for your your slides so i'm gonna i think let's I'm, just talk through this and we'll just have a conversation so don't worry okay yeah. sounds good. i'm enjoying the conversation so <laughs> i'd rather do the conversation yeah. um and one thing i want to point out before we move, uh, move forward on this the training topic is that in a lot of regulations it's implied training right like you implied because in order for you to run the program you've got to know what you're doing but right. the CCPA actually comes out and says, you've got to train people and you've got to demonstrate and be able to prove that you've trained people. So I think this training is, is not only a good practice, and frankly, we like to tell you, you can put all the tech in the world around somebody and if you get one happy clicker, they can take the system down, it doesn't take much. Um, but it's now being actually required. So just be aware that it, it really is something you have to be right. mindful of and doing. Right, and then of course you're measuring and reporting, right? So that's part of the illustration. That how do you demonstrate that you're doing things correctly? That feeds right into that next item. Um, so um, what's interesting is that what you'll find is that there's a lots of toolings out there for those of you that are technical. If you've been to the, if you if you've attended RSA even in the last three years, it's overwhelming how many options there are. There's just too many choices. And there's always a better mousetrap every year of the same, you know, addressing the same uh, kind of commoditized problem. If somebody tries to do it a little bit better and make it a little bit faster. And so it can be really hard to make a choice and know that, you know, you've made the right choice. So, um, so just remember, if you have a plan in place first, if you've done your discovery and you know where you're headed, yeah, it's a heck of a lot easier to figure out where you're going to be looking in terms of your tooling. And so even what we do, um, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, you know, we all frequently tell our clients, you know, approach this from a perspective of how am I going to get an outcome and look at the tools as ways to achieve that outcome, but stay focused on the outcome. Don't be distracted by the, the flux capacitor feature they just added to tool number two, right? So I could not agree more, George. And I like to remind people, you, you got to start somewhere. Start with an Excel spreadsheet and a Word document if that's all mm -hmm. you got. Like you can do a lot with those two tools. Absolutely. Does it require some man input? Yes. Does it require, you know, a little bit? You can make it fancy. You can make graphs and everything. But at the end of the day, those two tools can take you mm -hmm. pretty far before you have to start buying the Mercedes and the Lexuses and et cetera that are out there. So don't get caught in that. I totally agree. It's about the outcome and the plan. If a tool helps you get there, it can be worthwhile, but you can, we run a lot of programs on Excel and Word. So just be yeah. aware of that. Yeah, I share that. I would add Visio to the list so you can draw network diagrams and things like mm -hmm. that, but it's not the tools, it's the people. It's getting that commitment from the people, the knowledge, the education, and first and foremost, that commitment from the top all the way through the organization. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And that's part of the planning, right? So get that plan, it's the last item here, plan cyber foster, everyone should be doing that. Even as as Jordan mentioned, if, if even if you're a 10 person company okay, mm -hmm. or a one person company, this should be yeah. on your list with a, you know, with a, a spreadsheet and a Word document uh, or a text document if you, don't, you can't afford Word, right? <laughs> do what you need to do to get it done. Google uh, Doc, anything, I'm, I'm open anything, to anything. Right? So ultimately, have repo. Uh, the other part Yellow of that is, <laughs> yeah, the other part is attaining and attesting. Now that's not for everyone. There may be, um, some of you may just be burdened with industry related compliance. And so you'll understand what that means. 
Um, you may have auditors coming in or suppliers. I mentioned looming checklists before. This is where that, you know, being able to attain and attest that your program is what it is. And you can demonstrate that you've been doing, uh, you've been diligent in doing things without negligence. Because essentially that's where a lot of the problems lie are when those, uh, when those leaders are called to, um, you know, to respond to what have you been doing? And the only thing they can muster up is we install antivirus. And that's our that's our security plan, right? Oh, so that doesn't work you need anymore. a firewall too, George. Antivirus <laughs> yeah. isn't enough. And so anyway, so this is what I told you. I, so first, actually, George, just so, so everyone understands, uh, the the standard in the law is reasonableness. Like this law is not looking for perfection; they're looking right. for reasonableness. And mm -hmm. reasonableness is: Did I even have a conversation about this? Do I even understand that my computer is connected to the internet? Like some pretty basics, right? Like we're not talking. At this point, I think the law is changing quite rapidly. Um, but right now we're looking for, are you taking this into consideration? And part of that is, are you documenting and written security policies? And then can you demonstrate it? You know, it's great mm -hmm. that you do something, but if you can't prove it from a legal perspective, it's, it's not worth anything. So right. being aware that, that that standard isn't meant to be perfection. It's meant to be, are you taking reasonable steps towards addressing these requirements? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that emphasis on reasonable is just so mm -hmm. absolutely critical here because uh, there's there's no legal framework yet that defines it but it's it's like that elephant and the blind men you know we all mm -hmm. can see different pieces of it that way uh, uh and it, it, it it's going to become critical i think watching your side of this jordan over the next few years as the courts weigh in and as we begin to get some flesh on the bone so to speak of exactly what is reasonableness Exactly. Yeah. And, and we don't have that right now. And that's something to be very aware of. So a lot of people come to me and they want me to give them a black and white answer. And I tell them we're in the wild west right now. Yeah. You're in California, I can give you some answers, Massachusetts, New York, you know, certain jurisdictions. Um, but in a lot of ways, we're reading our magic eight ball. And we're also dealing with judges that themselves don't have a deep technological knowledge right now. And so it's mm -hmm. very challenging. So you have to be aware that this is a this is a new area. And the goal is to take reasonable steps to keep this journey moving forward. It's not a set it and forget it. Yeah. It's not gonna happen overnight and there's no magic pill that you can take or magic tool that you can use that's gonna address this. It's changing our mindset. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so let's let's get into the, so this is what I told you, or this is what you should have been <laughs> thinking. And I'm sure personally, a lot of you can, can relate to the first thing. People who have had their data stolen, they're just tired of the endless stream of your data has been compromised. Letters that are flowing into our physical mailboxes at our homes, right? This is the impetus for why these uh, the, these regulations are, are being introduced. Is that yeah. it's become overwhelming um, for the consumer to to switch up credit cards and to get another letter and great. I think I I think I have my credit reporting covered for the next 12 years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it's out of control, just like Vint had mentioned. Hey, we're not in a very good place right now. Well, so. also, I think our post office has far better things to do right now than delivering letters of the form, your data has been compromised. Let's let them do their business and let, you know, not have so many of these letters having to be delivered. And, and I think on the flip side, we have consumers who are now going, I have a consumer right that I can actually enforce against you now. So. Mm -hmm. With that annoyance and with that tiredness of receiving that, they're starting to say, well, wait a minute, why do you have my data? Why did you keep my data? Why is it being impacted? We're starting to have this more engaged consumer who's starting to ask questions. And with those questions is coming lawsuits. I mean, in California now, if there's a data breach, there's a private right of action for consumers. We're mm -hmm. starting to see that span beyond even California. And so I think instead of just maybe getting an angry phone call or email, we're actually seeing some bite to that tiredness that people are starting to have. That's right. Yeah, there's some definitely. Yeah. But now, note to the C-suite is the second one, as well as the board. IT and security personnel personnel are no longer solely accountable for hacks in the eyes of lawmakers. Right? It's <laughs> it's not working. Right? You can fire as many CISOs and CIOs as you want, but if the whole organization isn't on board, right? There's going to be a problem because now accountability cascades throughout all leadership teams, so yeah. mainly with the CEO and the board. So um, next, the cybersecurity mindset matters when leading cyber privacy and security risks issues. Right? If you are unable to use your leadership skills, 
let me rephrase that. We know you're able to use your leadership skills to lead your business. And often that technology and security for, for a lot of folks that have been around for a while, that portion is a little bit scary for them, right? So um, as a business owner, hey, I, I, don't, I don't, I'll just give it to the IT guy. That's such a natural response. And, and because that's a natural ground war response in terms of getting into the weeds and getting it done, they also tend to accidentally send the air war over to the IT folks, right? The mindset and getting the whole company on board, right? That is the responsibility of all leaders to make sure that everyone has that right mindset. So, yeah. Well, and, and I think and, it's also leading from the top because I can't tell you how many times we'll put, for example, two factor authentication. We'll require everyone to use two factor authentication, but not the CEO because that extra second is too valuable for the CEO to do it. Well, it's hard to enforce something that everyone knows is not applying to the top. And so I think sometimes you've got to lead by demonstrating that you're going to take it just as seriously. Like, I'm yeah. not going to be able to use my phone for this purpose because we've made a decision at the business level, even if it would make my life easier because I'm the CEO. And I see that a lot. They want to carve themselves out. And frankly, they become the biggest risk because wire transfer fraud, all of those big decisions are then you know, potential mm -hmm. risks through their email accounts. And so I think that's a huge thing. If you are a leader, you've got to follow what you're going to require of everybody in the company because that's how you push that mindset right. all the way down. Yeah, for, for, those, for those of us that are old enough to remember, it's when dad didn't wear the seatbelt in the car. <laughs> so I wouldn't wear a seatbelt because dad didn't wear one. Right? Yeah. And today yeah. The, the relatable example would be, are you in front of your iPhone and iPad at home in front of your kids? Right? all the time, what impact does that have on them, right? You know that that, that habit's gonna cascade down to them. So if you have the bad habit, yeah. bad behavior, or maybe not ideal behavior, it's going to resonate down. So set a good example or the best example you can set. Yeah. Leader. Tone. And that's what the Air War is about. And that's the last item, cyber governance yeah. is Air War. Illustrate your leadership, demonstrate it yeah. yourself too. Yeah, it's so much as that tone at the top. Uh, and the example of leadership is about examples. Leadership is not about uh, the way I was raised, do what I say, not what I do. You know, that was my parents' message to me. That's not leadership with all due respects. Leadership is follow my example. You know, this is the right way to be. And until and unless executives embrace that new reality, uh, we're going to continue to see ourselves in the same situation that we're now in. Absolutely. So this is what you have three things to do now. Get that CEO, or if you are the CEO, learn about how to lead cybersecurity. And you might need outside help for that. Um, mm -hmm. You have great security resources in-house, uh, um, in great, but look at Secure the Village. Great place to start for the, especially the technical teams. Um, and then there are other, uh, a lot of helpers out there who can work with you as well. We're one of them, uh, Omnistruct. Onboard a cybersecurity program. Get that program going. Get get on that framework fast. Okay. Um, that blueprint is what you get. That's the outcome out of that item. Um, and you may need help for that as with that as well. Um, but conduct that discovery. Right. And just start asking some questions. Hey, where is our data being stored? Right. Ask ask somebody in IT. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you're not in IT, right, this applies to you too. And I find out, you know. Hey, what's it like uh, in terms of the, you know, how the data moves in and out of our organization and what's on my computer uh, uh, and, you know, how can I do a better job protecting it? So even individuals that are producers in the field, you know, need to be doing this. Um, and this reminds me of a, um, of an example that I learned in uh, uh, an organizational behavior um, lesson uh, through some of the great professors that, are uh, trying to get these messages out. And that was a study that was done with these radiologist doctors. And these doctors basically were, they had a, they did a, they did a kind of an experiment where they had these doctors look at these scans of um, radiology results. And the error rate in terms of coming back with uh, the results out of the scans they reviewed um, was, uh, I believe it was like 12 or 13%. It was relatively high, so where they'd missed things or things were a little bit inaccurate. 
Then they did the same thing with the same sample size, right? But this time they put a picture of the patient on the actual scan. So the doctor would have to look at the scan and would see a picture of the patient. The error rate went down to 3%. So oh, this is an example of understanding that these privacy records are like that. So these privacy records of people, these are people. Okay. There's other records that's too, as well, of your coworkers or of, you know, a, a, an important account. You know, it makes sense to resonate with people in those kinds of situations. Those are the smart things to do. This is one of the many little things that you know contribute to cascading a cybersecurity mindset. Or you, you don't even have to call it that. Hey, let's. How do we keep privacy sacred? How do we keep sensitive data sacred? That's what the discovery is for. Try to under, how do you deal with that sensitive data? So, and then we of course have a, a governing cybersecurity assessment um, link here that we'll uh, happily send out. Um, and that's essentially. So what, I didn't really talk about what we do. Maybe you figured it out. We're <laughs> essentially a cyber governance service provider for the other 98% of businesses. A lot of people say yeah. hey, we manage compliance, right? Too many people say they manage compliance. They throw it tool at you and then they walk away um, or send a report and walk away. It, it, this is a hands-on issue and that's what yeah. we do. So. Yeah, well, and, and, and that whole piece of it, George, with just those, that language, this is a hands-on issue for mm -hmm. everybody in, 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 in the company, uh, from the C-suite all the way through to the receptionist and, and everybody in between, because any of them are apt to get that phishing email that is the start so often of the breach and unless they're part of the conversation uh, and invested in the solution um, there it's not going to connect with them i think your metaphor put a picture on the information this is somebody's sensitive information this could be your mother or your father your brother your sister your cousins your children think of it that way and that helps invest you in doing the right thing to protect it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted, wanted to know what some of the questions on the assessment are, you can just take a screenshot yourself and try to get these questions answered. But these are just to stimulate you to, to take action. Um, uh, or you can hit, hit the link that was in the previous slide. I'll bring it up one more time. But uh, so take a screenshot of this, you know, print your screen. Right? And um, uh, these are good questions to ask to kind of kind of do a little bit of qualification about your business. It's not all the questions to ask, but it gets mm -hmm. people thinking, so. Yeah, and there are other webinars we have uh, on the Secure the Village website in the Information Security Management Resource Kit with other questions of this same form uh, in, in, in different aspects of the business, uh, different yeah. webinars on, on of the same right. form. Awesome around here. Yeah. All right, so, um, we're at uh, an hour on the nose. Yeah. This is, yeah. George, thank you so much for leading this uh, webinar. Uh, sorry, we had some technical troubles. I'm having trouble with my uh, getting my slides to show, uh, so I won't show it. But our next uh, our, our next one of these is um, what's the date of that? It's September 10th, uh, the second Thursday of the month. Uh, my guess that. Uh, on, on that webinar is Bob Zukas. Uh, he was my guest a while back. Uh, Bob's the uh, founder and CEO of the Digital Directors Network. And Bob's got a new book, you might want to look this up on uh, Kindle, called The Great Reboot, uh, looking at uh, how one integrates risk management and at the governance level of, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of, of boards. and uh, We'll be talking about the the great reboot, the opportunities that it has for uh, businesses, but then also the implications it has in in governing risk uh, and and the broader technology risk of, of things that that businesses have to do. Um, we've also got a special uh, go to uh, a special webinar uh, September eighth from. Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. We've got Mark Ambinder, who's a senior fellow at USC Annenberg, and he'll be talking about, uh, he calls it taming the tiger, uh, 
what do we do with disinformation as we get close into you know the everything going on with the election and uh and not just the election, but all the craziness that, that's happening with fake news and uh, things like that. And, and, and Mark's a student of it. So we got a special webinar for him. Uh, I'm grateful, George and uh, Jordan, you know, thank you so much for being my guest. We'll get this posted, uh, this webinar posted, and we'll have contact information for both of you. Uh, Great. Yeah, I was just going to say, we, we didn't get a chance to get covered Jordan's uh, slides. So. We want to make sure that her yeah if you've got her. some slides and you want to send them off to me jordan we'll put those on the same part of the information security management resource kit uh very very definitely would would like to get those and want to get you both back uh george you're on our board and we're grateful to you for that uh, and, and for all your your support uh it's george who brought us vin surf and that webinar is also available on our secure the village website so uh go take a look at that uh Jordan, it's, it's been a pleasure working with you, and I look forward to more opportunities to do that. Uh, and, and George, thank you again. Any final Absolutely. thoughts, final comments? No, I, no, I, thanks, everyone. Really, I, think, I think Jordan and I have, have worked together for a little while now, and um, you know, the, a Secure the Village, Secure the Village was a, was, was a really refreshing find. Um, I, I, I can't, emphasize enough how important it is for communities to be involved in this problem because it's it's going to get worse mm -hmm. and so uh the uh, folks like jordan and, and i are going to be busy and there's going to be more demand um and uh you know that's that's wonderful that you know we have that opportunity to 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 have the potential for that job security but ultimately um you know we do do face palms a lot, um, you know. Uh, you know when we learn about different hacks and we we see publications on why things happen, and then you hear CEOs, uh, leaders testifying in front of Congress, and you're just you're saying something has to be done. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to remove we, the glasses first, and then the face palm. Right, comes up. right, right. <laughs> well, some people maybe not. Um, but that's another story is, is that, you know, go to cyberstability.org as well. So that's cyberstability.org. That's the global movement. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a global commission on the stability of cyberspace is, 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 is that, that, that's, that's that organization where, mm -hmm. um, you know, some people who are, are, are very respected, um, including Vint are, absolutely trying to raise awareness of how big of a problem this is so it's you know we have this huge gap globally um and there needs to be norms and mores and that's what they're trying to do around this issue of you know state actors or non-state actors attacking public internet infrastructure um hacking into uh, uh into businesses um for a number of reasons but you know ultimately it's a big problem and uh you know the very stability of the internet is at risk and so we have to all be aware of how serious of a problem this is so so yeah. um so secure the village is at the tip of that spear at, at a community basis and i'd like to see us secure the village in every single metropolitan and micropolitan market in the country at some point <laughs> because that's what it's going to take so, yeah, people-centered movements, and that—that that is part of our vision. Jordan, you and I spoke yesterday a little bit about doing something in Philadelphia that that same way. Uh, one of the norms, George, is user norms, and that's a place where I'm grateful, you know, proud that Secure the Village plays very much in that space. I, in some ways, see us as the last mile uh, to get whether it's to boards or families, but just getting the message out, helping people understand the, the challenges we're at, you know, we're having. And because of COVID, which has pushed us online more and faster than I think anybody was expecting us to do. I mean, we're now doing online events, maybe the way we were thinking we'd be doing them two or three years from now, but here we are already. Uh, and that just adds to the to the challenge we, we face. So uh, 
grateful that you're part of this group and you know and can help us there you introduced us to vint and and how cool that was so again th thank you and, and and jordan thank you as well uh, with that um we are done with this webinar i'll look forward to seeing everybody again in a few weeks uh at, at our next one with with bob zukas uh on the on the great reboot and uh until then we are adjourned thank you so much and thank you everyone be safe yep Thanks. be well bye